Hello everyone, I'm super excited. We've got someone else here today who is very graciously sharing her, her chronic fatigue syndrome or ME CFS journey with us. We have, I'm not sure if I'm gonna get it right, Lilamor, Lil is that correct? That's correct. But she said that we can call her Lilla because people struggle to get her name correctly. So I might go with Lilla for the rest of our chat today, if that's all right. <laughs> so Lilla, I'm calling you from San Francisco in uh, the US. Where are you in the world right now? Uh, I am in Sweden, in Östersund. It's smack in the middle of uh, Sweden if you look at a map. Yeah. Oh, okay. And what's, yeah. it, what's, it, what's the weather like in Sweden now? Is it getting quite cold? Yeah. It's, uh, it was supposed to be cold this time of year, but it's um, above zero and it is wet and it's windy, not the snow that we expected. Okay, oh. well, I, I imagine that's better than snow. <laughs> oh, yes and no. It's, uh, yeah. it's dark to be outside. Uh, yeah, yeah, I grew up in Canada, so I, I don't know if how close the weather is, but I imagine it's something similar. I definitely empathize, is my point. <laughs> So thank you for being here. How are you doing? I'm uh, quite all right, actually. I uh, have been uh, doing a lot of stuff today. Stuff I usually couldn't just uh, over a year ago. I couldn't do as much as I did today. I have been swimming. I have been uh, taking my car to check if it's all right. We have to do that every year here in Sweden. And uh, I have been studying and I have been washing the clothes and uh, yeah, and a lot of other stuff. Wow. Just a full day. That's a full day like for a anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly the reason that we decided to have this chat here today and to do a video about it is because you were unwell with chronic fatigue syndrome or ME-CFS for about 35 years, you've told me. Is that correct? Before you recovered? Yes. Yes. Wow. 35 years. So how did this all start for you and, and what did life look like for you before you started having health problems? Well, I did have health problems as a child. Okay. Um, some stomach issues. I uh, got uh, pneumonia twice and I had uh, the flu and colds. Uh, every th time anyone else in my class had it, I got it. So I was uh, quite unhealthy already and I had um, allergies and stuff like that so I wasn't really healthy but then at the age of 13 I had cold after cold after cold uh, during two and a half months before my mother took me to the doctor and uh, asked what should we do and they didn't know what they should do, so I got antibiotics. And uh, of course, I got uh, well, so to speak. But about 14 days after, I remember I reflected on not being quite there, not as healthy as I was before. I could feel it. But then I got used to it and life went on and um, it took some years and it got worse and it took some years and it got even worse and so on and um, it was very very terrible for a lot of years from 1998 until last year. Wow this all started very young for you then. So you don't really have much memories, I guess, then of just being really healthy and no health problems. It sounds like this has been kind of as far back as you can remember. Yes. Wow, I'm so sorry to hear that. Okay, so it sounds like this was gradual. It was coming on for quite a long time. You knew that things weren't right. You, when you're about 14, is that correct? You, it seems like that's when you really noticed that there was a time that things just didn't quite return back to normal. Yes, I, it was uh, really 
uh, some 14 days after ending that uh, antibiotic. Uh, and um, well, uh, when I was about 17 or 18, I realized that uh, my peers were doing things and they accomplished things, but I didn't have the drive or what I should say. And I was always tired when I got home from school and I didn't sleep. Uh, and if I slept, it was during the day, uh, not in the middle of the night because I was furiously awake, <laughs> if I can say that. Um, so it was quite hard. So this kept going on, and you you mentioned earlier you didn't know for a long time what was going on. Like, were you seeing no. doctors, or were they giving you any, any any information? Well, it took until uh, 1990 before I started to visit doctors because my back was aching so bad, and I had other problems. Uh, and of course, they sent me to uh, physiotherapy. <laughs> <laughs> and that didn't work as uh, you could expect it. Uh, I did about um, eight or 10 sessions. And then I was uh, struck with the uh, PEM, post exertion malaise. It, it took some time when I was young to, uh, to experience that. Um, it took some exercise uh, sessions and so on. But then it was real. So I had to sleep for weeks after that. So after the physiotherapy. Yes. So I didn't know what was going on. And everyone told me, oh, you're getting so perky and uh, you will have so much energy if you exercise. And I tried that several times. And guess what? No, no. I didn't get any energy. I was exhausted and I had to recover for a long, long time. So what did you think was happening? Well, I didn't know much about it. I tried to read about stuff, but internet wasn't uh, here yet, <laughs> really. And it took a lot of years to even uh, hear about uh, chronic fatigue syndrome and ME uh, and it didn't fit because it was uh, you should be light sensitive and you should be mm. this or that and I was uh, sound sensitive and I was smell sensitive <laughs> and cold sensitive and warmth <laughs> sensitive but never ever <laughs> light sensitive <laughs> So many of the points, I couldn't really see that. Oh, yeah, it sort of fits, but yeah, not really. So it took a long time to realize that it actually was Emmy. And how did this progress for you? Did it, you know, oh. stay about the same over time, or did it slowly get worse or better? Oh. What did that? What did that look like? Well, if um, in 1998, I had stomach problems, I had uh, brain fog, I had uh, skin issues, I had, well, um, a lot of uh, symptoms and pains and aches and uh, I never had the energy. I was just tired all the time and it was hard to recover. Anyhow, in 1998, I got a depression and it never ended. It just got deeper and deeper and deeper. I was on SSR SSRI medicines, but it just took the tip off the more deepest levels and it also cut the joy so I was pressed into this gray area and it didn't help and um, 
after three and a half years or so, I stopped cold turkey. And that is not what you should do. <laughs> Anyhow, because SRI wasn't good anyhow for me, I didn't feel a thing. It did nothing in my brain or my body, mm -hmm. except make me sweat like a pig. But <laughs> that's another <laughs> stuff. And it made me hungry and oh, no. like that. And, it, and really suicidal. After oh a few years, I was more suicidal than ever. And um, yeah, I have thought that thought a lot of times. I want to end my life. But I didn't. And I hurt before that because I now have a life. In um, 2003, I was working a bit and I was studying because I knew that I could study. I could do that better than working. So I had student loans and so to live on actually. And um, uh, I was working at a place that had um, a gym. So I, of course I started to exercise very, very easy. So I didn't do more than once a week. But uh, after 12 weeks, I felt that I, I simply couldn't go to the gym. I couldn't. It was like uh, after exercising during those 12 weeks and working, I just felt like my body was filled with wet concrete and I just couldn't move. Uh, uh, I sat in the machine and thought, oh God, I can't do this. I can't do this, never. So I stopped exercising and uh, come uh, February, 2004 and I crashed, just crashed. It was uh, about four months after ending my exercise. So I had to stop going to school. I had to stop everything. And um, yeah, uh, I could uh, still have some money from the Arbetsförmedlingen <laughs> uh, because I didn't have work and I could have some money anyhow. But it was hard and I begged the doctors to find the diagnosis. And I even mentioned um, ME, but no, they didn't listen. I begged and I begged, and then I got so tired I couldn't even beg. And I had different doctors every time I was at the doctor's office, every time for several years. So I had to take my story up once again and once again. So eventually I just, I just didn't have the energy to do it. The years went by. I have some notes here because in my story is <laughs> so long. Uh, anyhow, in 2011, I had found out that I didn't produce cortisol uh, as much as I should. And I met with a doctor that uh, worked a lot with people with adrenal fatigue. And I went there. It was in Stockholm, so I had to travel and I had to pay it myself and it cost me a lot of money. But at least I got a little better. So I had about three years that were semi good. Um, and I wasn't heat or cold intolerant as I was before. And uh, then I didn't tolerate the medicines I got. And so I was back on square one. And I had tested a lot of things. Um, 
weird, the weirdest stuff I tested was the MMS uh, or CDS. It's uh, mm, uh, weird compound you have to clean the water. Um, and uh, it was uh, all right. It made me feel energized, but I had to take it continuously. And it tastes like shit. And I couldn't take that anymore. So after four months of that, uh, I, I just I just couldn't take it anymore. It, it tastes uh, chlorine. So it's really, really disgusting. I do not recommend this for anyone. So don't do that. No MMS or CDS. I found deoxyribose. It does, it does actually help some. Uh, you get a little more energy during the day, but it's not like a miracle thing, but it really helps just a tiny bit. So you can at least have a few minutes mm -hmm. more of energy. Is that D-ribose? Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Deoxyribose, yes. Okay. D-ribose. Okay. And I did some dietary experiments, of course. I had this um, uh, thing I ate in the morning and six hours later, my belly was so achy and bloated and it was so full of gas that I, oh, it was terrible. And uh, I stopped eating gluten and everything that has with gluten to do. And I didn't uh, take um, gluten-free products uh, more than a few times a year because I thought it still made my stomach upset. Mm. And of course, I was reacting to the FODMAPs, not the gluten in itself. Okay. But of course, gluten does um, wreak havoc anyhow. But the FODMAPs was the worst because after ending the gluten romance, I actually had a, a flatter stomach and I didn't have as much pain as before. For people who might not know, can you explain what the, what the FODMAPs is? Oh God, no, I'm not is it... that good in English. Ah! But, it is, uh, but it, it's um, some, um, something in the food okay. that uh, makes your uh, you gassy and okay. irritates your bowel and so on so if you want to check it out it's a FODMAPS uh, okay. so <laughs> check it out for yourself because I don't know much about it <laughs> Thank you for doing this all in English. This is the downside of, of my trying to connect with people all over the world because I only speak English, so everyone's forced. Yeah, yeah your as, English is ex excellent though. <laughs> I appreciate it. I'm as sure long as I don't have to do it in French because then <laughs> we will not have a conversation. <laughs> and, uh, anyhow, in 2009, I started low carb, high fat. And it was a marvelous time of six months of happiness and energy. And then it ended, of course. <laughs> the story of a person with the ME, of course. <laughs> but um, I will come back to that later because um, I, know, I now know why it didn't work. As I said, I didn't eat uh, gluten-free products and uh, going on the low carb, high fat, I changed um, into eating um, vegetables that grew above ground. And I ate a lot of uh, those vegetables and so on. But uh, since it stopped having any effect, I ate a lot of vegetables and I, tried not to eat so much carbs and so on. 
and they ate a lot of fat anyhow because it was a bit of a difference. So the last years I was uh, very plant-based and so on. For people who don't know how, how a um, person with ME feels like, I can draw them a picture. When I woke up in the morning, I was more tired than when I went to bed, even though I had a good night's sleep or good night's sleep. Wow. Well, and I woke up dreading to go to the bathroom because then I had to stand up. And my feet were so swollen that I screamed when I touched the floor. So I had to walk to the bathroom and my fingers, today I can hold them up like this and I can do that. I couldn't um, take them uh, in, to each other because they were so swollen. And um, the only thing to do was to uh, have them under cold water and make them shrink. And then I could go uh, and do the business. But it has hurt like hell. And uh, when I moved uh, all through the day, uh, in my worst periods, it was like having that uh, wet concrete filling your body. And even if, if you got the reflexes to walk, I had to mentally push myself to walk because my brain just said, no, I'm not going to walk today. And I knew I had to go to the store and shop or something. And I, I just had to force my, my body to walk every step. Uh, it was ridiculous. It was the same thing when I was working I had to be on top of myself all the day. Just walk, do this, do that. Come on, move, do this, do that. All the day. So I was exhausted mentally also because it was so hard to uh, just supervise my whole day, every movement sometimes, you know during the day. I, I feel I felt something similar and when I'm trying to explain to people or to get them to understand what it's like this is something that I try and get across and I suspect to some people it might sound like I'm exaggerating or it can't possibly be but for the 10 years that I had ME CFS there wasn't a single day that didn't feel like a struggle there wasn't a single day that didn't feel like some sort of battle to get through there might be chunks of the day that were better or where I was doing okay especially towards the end when I was you know my health was improving but every single day and when I was working every single day was like a minute by minute, hour by hour, how am I getting through this day? It's just, it's no way to live. Even if you're not, you know, in the severe or the moderate, you know, we talk about classifying this illness, mild, moderate, severe, and it is definitely a spectrum. But even when you're mild, which is, I believe, what you're considered when you're able to work, life is still like hell, it's, it's really, really hard. And I think that's a hard thing for people who haven't faced this to understand, like how could every single day of your life feel like a struggle, but it, that's how it was for me. Yeah. So I empathize. Yeah, it's, uh, it, when it didn't work and it often didn't, when I was away from people so they couldn't see me, then I could, uh, and micromanage my day, like do this, do that. But suddenly I, 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 I just froze up and I stood. And, and my hands were clenching like this for minutes because I couldn't do anything, just clenching my hands. And I stood like that. And if someone dis disrupted this, it ended. But, um, if, if no one came, it could go several minutes before I could get out of that uh, clenching my hands and not reacting. Oh, it was terrible. And uh, yeah. <laughs> um, every year 
I felt like my IQ was, was dropped five points because I could understand less and less and I can find words. Um, I was so foggy sometimes I was afraid to <laughs> drive my car. And I drove my car because I had to get to places and I couldn't do it by foot. And I couldn't take the bus because I was so chemically um, intolerant. So what, perfume and smoke and uh, the smells of people and the bus, ah, yeah. It, uh, it uh, just made me even tired, more tired. It was like someone had a sledgehammer and banged in your head and you like, so, uh, your, um, it was like you got a sledgehammer in your head and um, you just had this fall of energy right there, right then. And then I knew I had to get home. Uh, it wasn't easy with uh, driving your car, brain fog, no energy. I was a <laughs> traffic hazard waiting to happen, really. It was bad. Were you on your own through all of this or were you married? Did you have children? Uh, well, I had a fiance from 92 to uh, 2005. And he didn't understand this and he blamed me for stuff and so on. So I had to fake my life before him too. The last uh, four years, I had to fake my life, really. And I lied that, to him. Uh, as in pretend that everything was fine? Um, it was like this. When he went to work and I was at home, I was supposed to have done things. And I couldn't get up uh, out of bed until uh, one or two in the afternoon. And I had to do the stuff, yeah. Um, so he said, oh, you have been sleeping all day. No, 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 I have been this, doing this and doing that. But of course I couldn't take it. So I had to end it with him. Um, so yeah, it happened. A lot of weird things happened. Um, but yeah, I had to fake my life really. Uh, now I have a new fiance since end of 2005. We moved together in 2006. Uh, and um, we have, uh, we have been uh, <sighs> coping with this because he can do things. Uh, he, he, wash, he did the washes, he did the dishes, he cooked often and uh, yeah, he had to do a lot of stuff here to make it easier on me. But um, of course, it looks like, like shit. <laughs> there is uh, stuff everywhere and dust everywhere, you know. But you have to live with that because mm -hmm. you, you cannot manage it. Yeah. Maybe I'll just ask, because when I'm listening to your story, and we talked about this a little bit before, but, you know, I said a lot of people reach out to me and ask me about finances and you know, how do people manage financially when they're facing an illness like this? So if you don't mind sharing, because you faced this for so long, for most of your adult life, what was that like for you? And how did you manage, manage the financial aspect of life when it was so hard to work? Well, I couldn't buy stuff, as mm -hmm. you can imagine. And... Uh, in periods, both me and my fiancés were out to work. And uh, so I had to, do you say, go on the dole when you're unemployed? Yeah. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't know what that expression, <laughs> but is it some sort of like un unemployment insurance or some sort ah, of like um, government well, aid? I had to go uh, on the... Uh, uh, unemployment insurances, of course, and okay. I did that for years on and, on and off. 
I took classes so I could get more in debt. We can borrow money to, uh, to uh, go to school. So I did that on and off when I didn't have work and I was about to be kicked out of insurance. I did work uh, with some stuff, oh, mostly uh, cleaning uh, because it was easier to get those jobs. And, you know, cleaning uh, for other people, when then you have ME, it's an um, oxymoron if, <laughs> if you really think of it. Oh, it was so hard. It was so hard. I am good at cleaning, but fuck, yeah. it was hard. That's a lot that. of work. That's a really oh, yes. hard work. And that's the other side of this too, is because we end up, even if you can go back to work, your resume, like your CV isn't looking so good because you have all these gaps and it's really tough and you don't want to, I don't know what it's like there, but in my experience, where I, places I've lived, like you don't want to be telling people you're off because you were sick. We should be able to tell people that, but I never really have felt like that would be a good idea. So it's, it's tough. I have always been open-minded about things. Okay. I never, I never made excuses. I'm quite the bitch <laughs> and say so because I, I, I often tell people what I, um, what I think. And uh, <laughs> when Good you're you. <laughs> abs no, well, and when you're absolutely tired, you have a boss that is, um, well. I won't say that word, but you have a boss that isn't really uh, manageable mm -hmm. and uh, he has to do some stuff uh, for us to be able to work. And then I say, no, this is to be your uh, thing to take care of. <laughs> then I get angry. I, I could explode. I could really explode because my body went, was fueled by adrenaline, not, uh, not uh, like uh, cortisol. I was fueled by adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And that is, it's a hard way to work, be pleasant, and mm -hmm. then you explode. So yeah, I don't want to tell people where I've been working, really. But that was in the olden days. Yeah. You know what? I found something similar when you're saying that story. I was thinking of because when I was able to work, the days I was at work when it was one of my worst days, when I just really was barely getting by, you know, hanging on by a thread, I did notice it was the days I stood up for myself the most. You know, I had zero tolerance for any kind of crap. <laughs> like I just I spoke my mind and there was just no energy for anything else. So uh, for better or worse, at the time, I remember thinking it was probably a good thing because at the time I didn't always stand up for myself as much as I should. But yeah, when you're exhausted, there just, it takes energy to mm. be happy and friendly and patient and word things all prettily and anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, then I have, I have been working with uh, uh, coffee machines and the vendomats you, where you buy, sandwiches and uh, candy in the machine, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, that is a heavy job. It's heavy to remember stuff. It's uh, heavy to carry stuff and it's like this all the day. So mm -hmm. you have, oh God, a fun job, but really not for me. Um, when it ended, I, oh, God, I needed a rest for a few years, but I had to work anyhow. So I, I was um, <laughs> dealing newspapers. I have been uh, uh, cleaning again, of course. And by 2009, the tempo for working with cleaning had been raised so much because the two economical crises that were 1993 and 2009, I think. So the tempo was so high. I, I don't honestly don't know how 
I could do it, but I did it for three years, cleaning again. But then I had to say, no, no more. Um, what, well. what is the general, uh, from your perspective or your experience, the general understanding or attitude towards ME or CFS in Sweden? Like what do people or doctors think? <laughs> well, um, could a big fat zero be? Um... <laughs> No one knows anything. So you have to explain and you have to do this and you have to tell them this is not in my mind. Uh, well, my mind is broken because of something, but I don't know what. Mm -hmm. And my whole body is a systemic issue, not some symptoms here or there. Mm -hmm. mm, but no, the, the, um, they don't know anything. My last doctor actually understood that this wasn't a normal thing. And when I actually had him sit down with me for two hours, lucky me, two hours, uh, and explaining what the fuck was going on, then he actually uh, embraced it. And he put me on a waiting list to a special clinic that uh, could um, uh, tell me if I had any or not. So that was um, three and a half years ago. So the wheels move slowly. And what day. happened when you went to this clinic? Well, that's the funny part. I haven't been there yet because the queue was so long. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes. The queue was so long <sighs> and it got longer because um, at, at the time where my doctor understood this could be the thing, the whole society was bombarded by uh, a celebrity person, a, an author, I think that had ME and then it started to move a bit so that uh, some, some more people came forward and they discussed it uh, briefly here and there. So the queue got longer. And because it is not in my region, it is down in Stockholm, uh, the people from Stockholm that come in the queue go first and then the out, outsiders have to queue longer. So yeah, I'm still waiting. But of course, something happened on the way. I am so curious. Usually when I talk to people and interview them, we talk quite a bit before and I have a pretty good sense of what their journey looked like and the things that help them to recover. But Lila, I, I, I have no idea how you got out of this. So I, I'm almost literally on the edge of my seat. I'm so <laughs> curious to hear after all these years and this horrible, heartbreaking, horrendous journey you've been on. Like what, how, how, what, what happened? How did you get to where you are right now? Well, um, in uh, the middle of May last year, I actually wrote a letter to uh, Universe. Uh, since I have a problem to call things God, I call it Universe. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone can do a letter like this and mm, say God or Universe or all of it or whatever they want. But I wrote a letter and I stated that I had had enough. I wouldn't fight anymore. And I wanted a solution. And I wanted it by the end of May. And then I put away that letter and forgot it. Because, yeah, Emmy brain, you don't remember stuff anyhow. So, <clears throat> sometime end of May, beginning of June. Uh, some weird persons appeared in my YouTube uh, flow. Where? What is this? Oh my God, I must investigate. 
So after two weeks of the normal sleeplessness and listening to these YouTubers with this special uh, message, I decided I am going to do this. It sounds weird and everything, but I'm going to do this. So I planned how to do it. And just as I was about to throw myself into it, I came across a person called Sally K. Norton. And she is an expert on oxalates. And that is a compound found in plants, plants that you eat, like um, spinach and almonds and um, beetroot and stuff like that and those could be very harmful for for people anyhow if you eat a lot of it or if you cannot handle it in your body and so I realized that uh, when she said you couldn't just stop with it because you would have an oxalate dumping in your body that could be so hard that you could be ill for weeks or months. Then I knew I had to uh, look at plants I was eating and uh, lower the amount of oxalate plants and so on. So I could do what I was supposed to do. And so I uh, stopped eating uh, the, the plants with much oxalate uh, at a get-go. And then I lowered the other plants uh, in, by time. And so by, from um, end of June, until the 10th of September, I did that tapering off. And on the 10th of September, I became carnivore. I don't eat any plants. Guess how many days it took? To 20. feel better? Yeah. I have no idea. 20 days. 20 days. 20 days. On, on and I one... woke up. I woke up and I was energized. And I could do stuff all that day. Wow. It was li like, what? I, I couldn't understand it. But removing all the plants, except for coffee, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> I removed all the plants and went carnivore. And uh, suddenly it was like my body had had the time to take care of the poison that was in my body already. So, and when looking back on 2009, when I was low carb, high fat, from the start of that uh, diet, I ate a lot of meat and fat and cheese. <laughs> And, um, but everybody else said, oh, you have to have all the vegetables uh, with that. So you shouldn't eat so much meat. It's dangerous. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So I ate more and more vegetables. And the last five years I have been eating plants like crazy and uh, not so much meat. And I was just, worse than ever. I was in bed or sitting uh, like 85% of my day and um, it was barely coping. But after 20 days on pure carnivore, it was like waking up again. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you say pure carnivore, the only thing that you're eating is meat. That is it, 100%. And, uh, uh, I eat, um, let's see now, I eat meat, I eat um, poultry, not so much. I eat fish, I eat eggs, a lot of eggs, uh, because I can tolerate them. Um, and I eat shellfish, 
and butter and some dairy. That's okay. I, yeah. So all like animal products. Yes. Is, okay. Wow. And you've yeah. been doing this for how long now? I have been doing this for uh, one year and near uh, two months. Wow. Right now my head is just like <laughs> exploding. Yeah. I, I know you're plant-based, you know, so I, I thought, well, everyone says to plant-based, but I have to tell people that some of us yeah. cannot take care of the the chemicals that the plants produce. Oh. So some of us need to explore if that is the issue. Yeah, because, that is fascinating. Yes, because when I think of it, I ate a lot of bread and uh, potatoes when I was young. Uh, we grew our own potatoes and my father, he was hunting. So we ate uh, quite a bit of meat, mm. but we also ate a lot of potatoes and bread. And even as a small girl, I had problems with that. So I was constipated wow. a lot of the time. Uh, oh, it was horrible, even before the age of 13. Okay, I gotta ask, are you not constipated eating nothing but meat? I feel like there's yes. a fiber shortage happening there. <laughs> you know, there is one, and I say one qualitative yeah. study done in the world, not a big one. Okay. One done, and it, they conclude that the less fiber you eat, the less constipated you get. Huh. And these were people that were vastly constipated. They had big okay. issues. And when they uh, upped the dose of fiber, they were yeah. more constipated. And when they huh. lowered it and even took it to zero, they really didn't have any symptoms. So it's only yeah. one study done, right? but everyone tells you that fiber, mm -hmm. oh, fiber, yeah. but it's only one study done and it shows the opposite. So. That's really interesting. I think the biggest takeaway from this is that we can't make any assumptions about things right. and, and, and it might be true for a lot of people or not, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be true for you. And, you know, like, uh, as you know, when I cut out meat, I started getting much, much better. And I had struggled with constipation throughout my illness. And as soon as I went plant-based, that was like, it was almost instantly fixed and I've never had an issue since. So, but I'm just one person, not, not even one entire study. So that's just, you know, anecdotal one person's experience. But I think that's the important thing though, is because the more people I talk to, the more I realize these recovery journeys out of this, out of MECFS are just so individual. And especially when it comes to diet, you really can't go off of what works for other people. You got to experiment. You got to be open-minded. You know, some people might not be open-minded enough to try a carnivore diet or a plant-based diet, but you're never going to know until you try them and see how your body reacts. Wow. <laughs> so, and, and this proves also that it is so different because your body has no problem processing the chemicals of the right. plants. But my body can't take it. Yeah. So um, you never know which one of these you are, or if yeah. you have to be in the middle, but uh, avoid this and that. So you have to somehow find uh, a way to explore this. Because so it isn't done like this. Yeah. I was just thinking too, and, and so much of what I read and of people that I talk to, it sounds like for a lot of us, um, MECFS seems to be brought on by some kind of stress on the body. So whether that's stress from, you know, some sort of abuse, whether it's stress from a whole bunch of mold in your house, if it's stress for some really bad virus that you got hit with, or, you know, maybe just stress because you don't have good coping mechanisms in life and you're a really high anxiety person. So you need to learn some skills to turn off that stress response you know, or it's stress from the things that are in the plants that are putting that on your body. It's just, yeah, it's just really interesting. And I, um, 
I'm so glad you share this because I never would have thought that removing plants would be the answer <laughs> completely. <laughs> I know some people do well on meat-based diets and I fully appreciate that, but I haven't talked to anyone who was doing a, like a solely meat, like animal um, product-based diet. So, yeah. Yes, but it, it is individual. You, you have no. to accept that. So, so, yeah. so I, I have also been bullied since the age of six years. So okay. that was, um, and when I changed school, I changed school, changed. Oh. <laughs> when I changed schools in, uh, by the age of 13, I thought it would be better, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be worse, even worse. And that uh, extra stress just made, uh, made my journey into ME the final, tipping point so to speak so it was a, a really stressful uh, being bullied for a long time oh i'm so sorry you had to go through that that sounds horrible yeah but um um you learn stuff from that too even though the not the possibility but i can't find the word the possibility to be more ill and more susceptible to weird mm -hmm. illnesses is greater if you get bullied and uh, that uh, could stretch your whole life so you die younger if you're unlucky and you have a harder time if you get bullied as a young person yeah that makes sense yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing this. This is fascinating. You know, if, if there's anyone else out there, I'm sure you're not the only one in the world that has this reaction um, to these no. plants. The, what was it? Ox 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 oxalates? Oxalates. Oxalates. Mm, yes. Yeah. Sally K. Norton. You have to write it down afterwards. So. Okay. I'll put a link in the video description for that as well. So people watching, if you want to learn more about it, just check the video description and we'll have some stuff for you there. Wow. So this is such a really crazy long journey. I, you've been through so much. It's probably a hard question to answer, but you know, I always like to kind of wrap things up and you know, what did you take away from all this or what did you learn or what, what advice would you have for other people who are facing this? Oh, it's so much, you know, it, it's part of, part of this journey is to take care of your mind because if you don't um, spend time uh, practicing uh, things to make you more positive and uh, uh, find things that make you happy in life and so on and uh, find a way to boost your mentality in some way you you will probably uh, have a much harder time I have spent hours and hours on that and I thought well it's no use but I really did survive because I uh, wanted to go forward and I had to uh, retrain my brain somehow during all those years. But it's hard because often you don't have the energy to really do it. So you come back to it from time to another. Um, if you cannot do it this week, well, then you have to wait a couple of months and then start over again, but it's worth it. And um, more, yeah, you don't know what will fix you. So you have to have all these interviews to at least uh, intuitively feel what should I try next? And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah. And what should one take with them? Well, just don't give up because on the other side, you have so much because you did this ME journey. And it's, um, it's uh, enriching you, not when you're ill, 
but afterwards, it, it sounds so terrible, but after 35 years, I must say this, you get so much more you um, because you know yourself. You only have your own company when you're in the bed or when you fight uh, with trying to work or something like that. You only have you and you're so much. So when you get on the other side to be healthy, then you have it on the plus side because you're so strong. Thank you for all that. It resonates with my own experience as well. And I think that's, that's really important stuff. I wonder what is what is life like for you now? Like, what does it feel like to be well after all those years of struggle? Like, what does life look like now, or how do you feel about life in general? Well, I was afraid to exercise. I can tell you that. So it took seven months before I did it, and uh, today I'm exercising about three times a week. I am forty nine years, so. I need to build my muscle mass if I'm going to live any length now that I am healthy. Uh, I have started to study again because I needed a profession that wasn't cleaning <laughs> other people's homes. So I am studying right now and I will be uh, if it call if you call it that sterile technician so I am going to work in the with the medical instruments and steer, sterilize them so that is my uh, profession to be it's <laughs> excellent good for you how exciting and, and uh, as uh, well I do have uh, things I do that makes me happy and I can actually do them. But even though I am healthy, I have a time, <laughs> a time managing problem, you know. <laughs> and after 35 years of being ill, not being a healthy grown up, I have this uh, problem with planning things <laughs> and getting things done. But uh, hey, I don't take that too serious. If I want to <laughs> sleep a half a day because I, I just can't uh, come up with something to do or it is too much to do, well, then I do that. Because I find that uh, if I sleep because I want to do it mm -hmm. and not because I have to do it. That's a whole different thing. So. I completely agree. And I feel the same now about sleep. If I sleep in or I take a nap in the beginning, mm -hmm. I used to get worried and I think, does this mean that I'm still not well? Or is there something wrong with me? But now I just know, you know, our body sometimes needs a bit more sleep. And now before I go, if I want to take a nap, I say to myself, ah, a beautiful indulgence. Like I just think of it as this luxury thing that I'm doing for myself, you know, instead of before yeah. it was stress, like you, I need sleep, I need naps. And now it's just, yeah, it's a different, different thing. So I think I get what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Lila, so, so much for getting in touch and for taking the time to share all of this. I find this absolutely fascinating and so inspiring. And I'm so excited for you as you absolutely deserve, you know, everything that you have after so much struggle in your life. So thank you. Thank you a million times over for taking the time to share this with us today. Thank you for, for having this channel because I, I have no time for that now. Really. And no, no drive to do it. So I think it's good you have this channel so that I can share my view anyhow. Yeah, I, I think it's I think we're all a bit different and it depends. I suspect 
most people who recover just get up and go on and keep living the rest of their lives and good for them. And that's wonderful. But then the, the downside of it is that we don't get to hear about all these people that recover. So that's what, I, yeah, that's the good thing about having a channel is I'm trying to pull some people from around the world so we can get some of those stories out there. Because there's a lot of people that still believe that full recovery is impossible or, you know, it's just understandable. People get very hopeless. There's a mix of information. So, yeah. All right. And if anyone has questions for Lilla, you can email her. This is her email address on the screen here, and it'll be in the video description as well. And you can, of course, leave comments under this video. If you have questions for her or for me, we'd be happy to answer them there. And if you're watching, and if you have a recovery story from MECFS that you'd like to share, please get in touch. My contact information is in the video description as well. You can just send me a message on Facebook or Instagram, and I'd love to chat with you about this. So that's it. Uh, thank you to all of you watching. Can't wait to hear what you think about this amazing and inspiring story. And thank you again to you, Lilla. And uh, yeah, take care, everyone.